Well, I want to talk a little bit about your reading for this week, which is the great book on the Incarnation by Athanasius. Um, my copy of it uh, looks like this. You may recognize this book because I read from it the very first day of class. I read um, C.S. Lewis's introduction to Athanasius. That was where I talked about uh, the value of reading old books, you know, my apologetic for why I structure this class around primary source reading. C.S. Lewis says that if you want to uh, understand, um, you know, a particular philosophy, an idea, you go back to the, the people who wrote about it, not the modern books, because he said the, the ancient person, because of the, their greatness, is, is able to actually explain things oftentimes in a simpler way than the modern books actually do. And I can attest to that because I spent a good part of the day trying to review my, um, my knowledge of uh, Athanasius. I confess, I don't think I've really thought much about him since um, the uh, last time I, I worked through this material. And uh, I spent a while reading new books, modern books about Athanasius. And my head was spinning. I was thinking, I'm not sure exactly what Athanasius said. But then when I go back to read Athanasius, I find he is clear, he is lucid, he is uh, encouraging. Uh, for the most part, he is correct. I think there are some errors in his thinking, a little bit of off balance um, in some ways. But, uh, you know, for the most part, very encouraging. And I think a good corrective for uh, some of the errors that I think we see prop up in the church today. Um, I plan to spend a good part of the lecture for uh, this week talking about Athanasius to kind of set up the context. So I don't think I really need to do much in this video. Um, but, but I will talk a little bit about this particular work on the Incarnation. <laughs> and most of what I have to say here is we don't really know much about the context. Uh, the question is, um, when, when was this book written? Um, some say that it had to be written uh, around 318 AD uh, before uh, Arius began, uh, or before rather Athanasius got word, that Arius was teaching the things that he was, was teaching. Um, the question is, does this book have a, um, you know, show any evidence that, uh, that the author is responding to the error of um, Arianism in, in his work? Um, is there any evidence that this is a response to Arianism? Or is this just a book about the value of the incarnation, the, the beauty of the incarnation, before Athanasius even learned that there was such a thing as the Arius doctrine, the Arius teaching being the, the idea that Jesus uh, wasn't actually God. Um, Athanasius said that we need to confess that there was a time when he was not. So there was a time when the Son did not exist. So that was Athanasius' teaching, making Jesus less than fully divine. Is this book at all a response to Athanasius' teaching? Or is it rather just a statement that comes out strongly affirming the Incarnation prior to um, uh, Athanasius hearing about Arius at all? And to be honest, I, I don't really know. Um, I, I'm not, <laughs> I don't have enough knowledge of the debate uh, or of Athanasius or the context to really weigh in that definitively. Um, but I will say this. One is that it, it does stand to reason uh, given what we know of Athanasius, I'll, I'll give a little bit of evidence on both sides. Um, it stands to reason, given what we know of Athanasius, uh, that it would not be unusual for him to, you know, after a conflict is already developing, for him just to write a book that just revels in the beauty of the Incarnation. You know, even as the controversy is flourishing and, and um, you know, ra raging around him, um, he's just glorying in reveling in, being amazed by the beauty of the Incarnation and how the Incarnation is necessary for our salvation. Uh, for, er for Athanasius to write um, the book on the Incarnation uh, without trying to refute Arianism, but just glorying in the Incarnation, even after Arianism was around, that would not be uncharacteristic of him. On the other hand, um, what we also know of of Athanasius is that he is you know, not politically motivated. He is trying to um, he's trying to defend the truth that he loves. And so to see that this book was written with a strong, strong affirmation of, of the incarnation of God um, 
becoming man without ceasing to be God, the eternal God becoming man, um, for him to have written this prior to anything that uh, you know develops with Arianism, that would not be inconsistent of what we know of Athanasius either. The point is, we really don't know when this is written. And so it's hard to say exactly what this book is doing because it could be you know, arguing for the, um, uh, the incarnation that God became man uh, in the midst of a controversy that is ravaging, r- raging on, or it could simply be a statement that comes out you know, affirming the incarnation just for the, the beauty of it. It could be just pastoral, um, not at all polemical. Uh, and uh, you know, I'll leave you to kind of decide that. Um, let me say just something to look for in your summary. Uh, we'll talk, hopefully we'll get to this in class, but the beauty, I think, of the uh, Eastern Church, and Athanasius is right, he's representing the Eastern Church. Uh, last week we talked a little bit about Tertullian, uh, who was representing the Western Church, writing in Latin, with a strong legal, Roman legal background to what he was saying. Athanasius is not uh, writing with that legal background, which I think could um, hurt him to some degree, but I think also helps him a lot too. Uh, he is um, he is writing and he is looking uh, at the incarnation and not seeing it as a means to an end. He is just reveling in the beauty of the incarnation um, and sees how the incarnation is so essential for our salvation. Because, you know, the, the famous phrase by Athanasius is that um, the Son of God became sons of men so that sons of men could become sons of God. And he doesn't understand that we become sons of God in the same way that the Son of God is the Son of God. And there, there's a very, there's a, a, a discontinuity in that phrase, Son of God, between what Jesus eternally is and what we become in him. Those two uh, we use the same word there, son of God, but we don't mean the exact same thing. There's an there's a equivocation there. Um, but, but the point is, uh, the mystery of the incarnation is, uh, in some sense for Athanasius, what constitutes our salvation. You know, we are saved in the incarnation. Now, I think there's a little bit of a problem with how far Athanasius goes here, because it makes the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ not terribly important. Um, he, he affirms them to be sure, but they don't work into the main theological uh, threads of uh, the way he understands the doctrine of salvation. The way he understands the doctrine of salvation, it is Jesus, um, or the Son of God, taking on human flesh so that he is then purifying that flesh so that in the incarnation um, we have... Uh, we, we become purified, we become like God, uh, not, not deity. He's not, pro, uh, he, he's not doing any uh, damage to the creator-creature distinction. He is affirming that distinction. But he sees that, that in the un- incarnation, uh, the Son of God, by taking on human flesh, is purifying our nature so that we uh, can become like him and that in him we can know God um, and be like God. So that's his model of salvation. And, um, well, as I said, I think there are real weaknesses because it doesn't, it doesn't do any, uh, well, it doesn't emphasize the importance of the death and resurrection, an importance which we see the, the apostles in Scripture um, affirming strenuously, right? This is of first importance, Paul says, that Christ died uh, according to the Scriptures and that he was raised according to the Scriptures. That, that is of first importance. So, you know, I, I think... There's a balance that's off with Athanasius. And um, the other thing that we don't see really at all with Athanasius is the doctrine of justification. So, you know, legal language is really helpful to affirm the doctrine of justification, uh, which Athanasius doesn't give much, well, it doesn't, you know, mention at all. Um, That said, uh, I think what we do really, really want to appreciate here is the the beauty of the, uh, the incarnation itself and the way in which believers are then united to Christ. Uh, if we, well, while I think that legal language is an important um, 
thing in, thing to bring in to understand our salvation because Paul uses legal language there with justification, righteousness, adoption, all that is legal language that needs to be brought in. And we need to recognize the, the, the legal sphere in which it is um, uh, referencing. Uh, but but there's a, a beauty, too, to looking at the, um, the, the way in which believers are united to Christ um, and, and that the incarnation is necessary for that union to occur. Uh, so I think that the East is, uh, is really does a good job at helping us see the incarnation not as just a means to an end, but as, as really part of the essence of what our salvation is. Our salvation is communion with God. And in the person of Christ, we see man and God in, in closest communion possible. We see that in the incarnation. And because of our union with Christ, we are brought into that union. And, and so the language there to, to talk about salvation as, a, as one of union and the change that happens in us because of that union, uh, I think is a corrective to some of the, uh, um, the too much emphasis in the, the legal aspect that we can see sometimes today. Anyway, I, I just encourage you to look out for that as you read the book. Um, probably gave a little bit too much of that away, but nevertheless, uh, you know, be on, um, have it on your mind, the ways in which Athanasius and, um, you know, our modern understanding could differ a little bit and, and see if you see in Athanasius things that are helpful correctives to uh, some of the unbalanced tendencies that we have today. Well, I look forward to reading your papers and uh, seeing what you come up with.